What's going on, Steelers Nation? Welcome back to the channel. Sunday night football talk. Uh, we're going to talk some Steelers, some free agency, NFL draft, all that stuff. Joining me today is my good buddy, Zach Smith, around the 412 Steelers Now, Steelers Afternoon Drive co-host. And honestly, one of my biggest inspirations in terms of getting into the content oh, creation on. game. Laying it on thick here, but no, thanks, <laughs> my boy. Uh, definitely one of the best in the business. Excited to talk some ball. How are we doing, brother? I'm good, man. I appreciate you having me. I appreciate everything you just said there right before me coming in. You said Sunday Night Football Talk. I feel like I should have slid in like Collinsworth. We're doing some Sunday Night Football <laughs> Talk. I gave you a heads up uh, on the intro. Yeah, no, but I appreciate it. I appreciate being here. It's been a while since the two of us have, have chopped it up, just the two of us together. Uh, done a couple afternoon drives together, but especially something like this, like on your channel, we're going to be doing today, answering questions. We haven't done something like this in a while, so excited yeah. for this. Yeah, I'm going to try to do, obviously, I've been trying to keep the content flowing, uh, trying to do as much as I can. Uh, this is kind of like my busy season in terms of, you know, the Steelers offseason, NFL draft season is kind of like where I've kind of made my name. And um, yeah. this is just like my favorite time of the year. And I know like that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on the channel because I know you feel the same way. Like this stuff just really gets gets the blood flowing. Um, you know, I, I threw it out on Twitter for everybody to ask us, you know, questions about the NFL draft about free agency, all that different stuff. So we're going to answer your all's questions um, as much as we can. Just before we get into it, y'all know the deal. Please make sure to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Drop me a comment on what you guys thought of the video or if any questions that you guys want me to answer in the comments after this is posted, which will be up tomorrow morning. Um, I'll get to as many of those as I can as well. So, um, Zach, I know we talked a little bit about before we jumped on. We got to talk a little bit about the quarterback questions, mainly because yeah. I have been avoiding a lot of quarterback questions on my Twitter recently <laughs> and on the channel for obvious reasons. I just feel like the discourse has gotten, you know, extremely toxic. Um, but there are some quarterback questions in here. So I just want to kind of get those knocked out of the way and then we can kind of move on to the other positions that people want to know about with free agency, with the NFL draft. Uh, this first question, I guess we'll get into. Um, let's go to Jeff's question. Uh, starting quarterback for 2020, who you'd prefer versus who's most likely? I'll let you answer that first. <laughs> Well, what's funny is the, the way you introduced this was that you've been avoiding the quarterback discussion. The exact opposite has been going on on Steelers afternoon drive. We talk quarterback basically <laughs> every single day since the season ended. Um, you know, who I'd prefer, right? Like, I mean, Kirk Cousins, they don't have the money to do it. But, like, I think that he would have, give them the best chance we at least see them take a swing on what he would bring to the table. Um, I know that, like, maybe it isn't as, like, risk adverse as you would think because he is the age that he is coming off an Achilles injury. But, like, just in terms of the performance that he's provided for the Minnesota Vikings and the floor of what you think that he could do in an offense. And, again, like, it may be that this is an ideal offense for him at his age coming off the injury when you talk about just him being able to turn around and hand the ball off as much as he does and, like, the guardrails that are kind of built into the offense for the quarterback uh, within Arthur Smith's offense, like how simplified things can be for him. Um, so I would say that's probably like the number one option if you're just taking away what the salary cap implications are for all of these guys. Most likely is Kenny Pickett. I mean, the most likely scenario for me for 2024 since 2023 ended was Kenny Pickett veteran backup mid-round draft pick and, and you know you can argue about who that that veteran in the middle is going to be there is it mason rudolph coming back i tend to think no i think it's more of like a ryan Tannehill Agreed. or jacoby Brissett type that we're talking about there uh for a couple of reasons and maybe we can get into that but but on the on the surface quick answer who i prefer kirk cousins most likely kenny pickett yeah, I agree. I mean, the things about Cousins, man, my opinion on Cousins as a quarterback has changed drastically over the past couple of years. Just some of the things that he do, he does um, on the offensive side of the ball are just, um, I feel like, really underrated. Like some of the stuff, just like simple stuff, the way, the depth that he sets the pocket at, how he maneuvers through traffic, how he throws under pressure, um, you know, his willingness to push the ball down the field, but also throw, throw into tight windows over the middle of the field. All those things are really conducive mm -hmm. to what Arthur Smith wants to do on offense, right? Play action. Like we've constantly heard Cousins and Shanahan and those type of systems be linked together for years and years and years um for these specific reasons and you know would it would it be feasible i mean it's it's not impossible but you're gonna have to pull some major strings i mean you'd have to restructure yeah. you know tj watt Minka fitzpatrick alex highsmith now are those strings that could potentially have negative ramifications three four years from now absolutely um i think we're pretty much on the same page though in terms of um you know i just feel like with the defense with the age um on that side of the ball you know what they were 32nd in adjusted snaps uh last year on defense in terms of age i just would like to see them push the this is the time 
Yeah. yeah I mean, like, I, it just, it would, I, I would I, hate to waste another season or two looking for, you know, a borderline top 10, top 12 ish quarterback, which is what I probably would label Kirk as if you're into ranking mm-hmm. people like that. Uh, just because, you know, it's been seven years since they won a playoff game, too. So, like, I would really hate for it to be one of those situations where TJ Watt ends up being 32 years old and he doesn't have a playoff win. And then you're on the course of, you know, having to blow this thing up and rebuild, um, you know, without really much to show for, you know, one of the best players that we've ever seen wear the jersey. And I do agree with you in terms of um, the most likely options. I, I really do believe it's going to be Kenny Pickett and Ryan, Ryan Tannehill. I've talked at length about that. Um, you know, there are some other options out there I think are worth exploring. I like Jacoby Brissett. He would be honestly a preferred option for me, even despite the familiarity within the system that Tannehill brings. Um, I just think Jacoby's mm-hmm. a little bit better of a quarterback. I think he's got a stronger arm. I think he honestly, like the things that he did for Cleveland two years ago were really impressive to me. And there is a little bit of carryover in terms of what um you know, Stefanski does and what Arthur Smith likes to do on offense. We could get into that, but um, in terms of passing game stuff, but short answer, those are the quarterback takes. I just, I don't want to turn this into like a quarterback only pod. Like I know, I know you don't, but real quick, I do want to say, because you said Stefanski, like, Mm -hmm. and I, and I assume that this is going to get done. He's not even going to be on, on the market, but like Baker Mayfield, I mean, like he would be right there for me, honestly, if he's not going to return to Tampa, a guy that's, you know, uh, pretty up and what a roller coaster career he's had but like look yeah. at his stops how many guys that he's worked with he's worked with Stefanski McVay and his tree there and then Dave Canales who just got a head coaching job in Carolina I mm-hmm. mean like great reclamation project that they got in Baker Mayfield um you know I'm not saying that like there's better ball in front of him than the ball that he just had last year in Tampa but yeah. there's like part of me that is very intrigued by that yeah. And I mean, like Baker's at least had flashes. Right. And like, I, I think that that's yeah. kind of the I, I think that a lot of people are misconstruing the conversation around Pickett a little bit. Um, you know, you and I, I think the last time I was on Afternoon Drive a couple weeks ago, we, we had talked about some of the things that Pickett has had to deal with over the course of his two years with the Steelers. Like, I don't think the environment's been nearly as bad as a lot of other first round quarterbacks have had. Just my opinion, mm-hmm. because I think that the weaponry that he's been surrounded with um has been pretty good in comparison to some other like first round draft pick quarterbacks. Uh, but I think we can all acknowledge like Matt Canada, not an NFL offensive coordinator. Like just, those are, those are just the facts. I mean, he's, he's been dealt a bad hand in that regard. The thing that I think it makes it tough is, you know, with a lot of young quarterbacks, it gets really hard. Like in, in two years, like if you haven't flashed really any type of high level play to get you there's really nothing like tangible to get you to hold on to. Like I know everybody points to that game after Canada was fired with the Bengals, but like how many quarterbacks over the last two seasons have had a better game than that game that Pickett had against the Bengals? Like probably 40. I mean, like, I mean, it's just, it's, there's a lot of just, I feel like mediocrity that we've seen or a lot of struggles and there's just not enough high level flashes to get me to buy into another season of this. Even if I am optimistic about, you know, Arthur Smith, some of the guardrails that he has on offense, some of the things that he could do to make Pickett's job easier. I do think that Pickett, if he gets the chance and can get the offense down quickly, he will have better numbers next year. Do I think that he's the type of guy that I would be willing to bet on, you know, a guy that's going to be able to lead you to the like playoff wins and stuff like that. I have no reason to believe that right at this second right now. And just again, with all the other things, it would be different if the Steelers were absolutely terrible. And we knew that the Steelers were headed to a three win season. I think it would be easy to say, Hey, let's run it back with Kenny. Give him one more season. We'll just see what happens. And worst comes to worst. They'll be picking top five. They'll be in position to get another quarterback quarterback class mm-hmm. next year. Isn't as great as this one is pro- yeah. potentially probably, um and then you know we just i think even with the quarterback struggles i mean they won 10 games last year like worst comes to worst what's the floor for this team next season i think with a even average off season this is still probably not a team that's going to be picking at the top 10 even if things go off the rails again at the quarterback position so sure. i don't know it's 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 tough for me but yeah you have any more comments that you want to get off your chest with the quarterback uh, stuff before we move on well, to stuff that hasn't been actually, covered a million I wanna... times I want to bring up another question. Yes and no, because okay. this person, Thomas, said 
Fast forward to March 2025. The Steelers are 10 and 7 with a first round exit, and either Kenny or Rudolph, assuming Rudolph's back, can establish themselves as the future of the team. Is the draft or free agency a more likely route to solve the QB position? In this scenario, they would be picking around 20 as they did this year. And my answer is yes, because I think you have another offseason like you did last year, and you are much closer in terms of the roster construction to be able to compete and say you are just a quarterback away. And I know there's like some pushback, and I've been, even played devil's advocate to the like quarterback away type thing because if you have like that type of guy any team can be a quarterback away like no one said last year Houston was a quarterback away Mm -hmm. from being a playoff team and look what they did so there's certainly like obviously cases where that's not going to be the case but anyway my point is the Steelers you know if they run back to 2024 offseason similarly to the way 2023 did uh and Omar and Andy knocked it out of the park again I do think that they go in 2025 or 2024, 2025, like feeling a lot better about the rest of the roster. And then you can take a swing at quarterback. I just, while I can make the case for them doing it right now, I can absolutely say it's a necessary move to make next season if they still don't have mm-hmm. an answer there. Yeah, no, and I thought you guys brought up a good question. I actually put this out on Twitter a couple of days ago. It's really the only quarterback centric comment I made all week, just because, like I said, the discourse has gotten mm-hmm. just off the rails, toxic in all directions. Um, but you guys said that, you know, y'all posed the question, like, could you have a successful off offseason if the Steelers yeah. don't upgrade a quarterback? And I think that's a really good question. I think it does kind of matter how you qualify successful. I think you can have a successful team building offseason. But if your goal is to win next year and they don't upgrade a quarterback, it would be tough for me to personally lean yes to that question. Yeah. And I think you can yeah. approach that and it can that question can mean a million different things. Um, but really, I think it just depends on what you're trying to do next season. Um, and that probably depends on your perspective of the rest of the roster as well. So um, a lot of good questions there. Um, one more thing that I just want to we'll, – we'll finish with the quarterback uh, discussion right now. Uh, we're going to go to Caleb's question. What makes the most sense to you long-term trading for Fields or Draft and Spencer Rattler? Oh. What do you think about that? Um, you said mid round quarterback, so I, I figured that was a good segue. Yeah, into the Rattler. you know, Rattler, Rattler's had, and we'll see how the rest of this plays out for him. But like up until this point, I maybe for me the biggest riser of the quarterbacks. Like I, I think that he's played himself into where I thought he would be, basically in the exact same type of spot as like a Michael Pratt or like a Jordan Travis is somebody really liked him to like, I think he's, he's definitely above those two and we could see him go on day two, probably like in round three. I would, I didn't view him that way prior to the senior bowl. He was probably the only guy at the senior bowl. And that includes Pratt. That includes Panix, That includes Bo Nix, um, Sam Hartman, but I didn't necessarily think of him very highly going into that process that like elevated as opposed to went either stagnant or the other direction. Um, I, but I still lean fields here. Um, just because I, I think one, the fit within the offense and two, I, like if you were, dra- if you were looking at fields as a prospect back then or Rattler as a prospect coming out right now, the clear decision is, is Justin Fields. And, 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 you know, sometimes just do need that reset, you know, not a great situation in Chicago and I'm not absolving him of everything that's gone on there. Cause sure. I certainly like, I, I I'm, I'm not even advocating to trade a two for him. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, I, that, that I'm on the fence about that. So, uh, but if you're giving me the decision just between those two guys, I, I, I lean Justin Fields. Yeah. I mean, talk a little bit about Rattler. So my perception of Rattler was kind of that I was out completely, um, entering the season. And I only saw South Carolina play a couple of times, uh, this year live, but I watched them live and I, yeah. And I mean, I was, you know, kind of taken back. I was like, this is kind of the guy that I thought I saw a couple of years ago at Oklahoma, um, mm-hmm. I've watched two games of Rattler on film, uh, just like studying him before the combine and just some of the things that immediately pop out. Um, his supporting cast in South Carolina this past year. Awful. Dreadful. I mean, yeah, that's what I was saying. Like he was elevating very, a very yes. bad offensive line I, against against good competition in the SEC. And I, I think that when you look at quarterbacks that can do that, um, that's definitely intriguing to me. The way that he was able to throw under consistent pressure, he did. He showed off the playmaking ability. You know, he's a guy that can throw on the run. He can, you know, get out, play out of structure, all those different things. Um, I also thought his accuracy was really impressive in the couple games that I watched. Like he was layering throws over defenders, throwing with touch, fitting ball into tight windows. Um, the thing with Rattler is, you know, he's. I think there's obviously going to be the maturity questions. I don't know. Like mm-hmm. a lot of people have that perception of him just because of how he was coming out of a high school recruit. Um, yeah. Some of the other things I just like looking at my notes right here. 
um, I, I don't think the arm talent is like I think his arm he can throw from different angles, and I like some of the accuracy stuff that comes with his arm. But I don't think that he has an overly strong arm, and he's also just no. relatively short. Like he's a guy I, that he's, I think he's Baker Mayfield with not as much arm strength. Yes, I, he is like kind of the Baker build though too. Like he's only yeah. like six foot, but like he's kind of thicker. Right. So like Baker is in that same build where like. He's short, but at least you don't have to worry about, you know, is this guy going to just completely evaporate when a defensive lineman hits him at the next level? So um, just some quick thoughts on fields. Um, I do agree with you. If it's up to me, um, here, here's one of the things about fields. And I, I've talked about fields at length on Twitter. I wrote an entire scouting report on SteelersNow.com. So you guys can go read that. Um, strengths, weaknesses, all that stuff. Still may do a fields video for the channel. I don't know. Um, but the thing with Fields, man, is like a lot of his, uh, you know, his flaws are just in, it's so frustrating. I mean, this dude is an absolute roller coaster on film. I mean, he does some stuff that you absolutely can't teach the out of structure, the running ability. I mean, it's so frustrating that he hasn't put it together yet because the arm is incredibly strong, throws with incredible velocity, one of the best runners, most athletic quarterbacks that we've ever seen in league history. And there are just some mind boggling things that just bug you man like the accuracy the lower body mechanics the footwork throwing off balance he plays from a bad base in the pocket the propensity to take sacks like he can make guys around him look better and he can also make them look worse just by his play style and it, it varies not even like game to game it's snap to snap with him and it's so frustrating um one of the things that i would kind of propose about the the the, the fields discussion though you, we, we just talked a little bit about like our expectations for this this coming season, even if the Steelers don't have necessarily the greatest offseason or they don't upgrade a quarterback. The floor to the Steelers season, as long as the defense stays healthy, is probably not in the top 10 discussion. Right. We probably both agree there. Yes, absolutely. OK, so when and again, I'm not saying that this is the right decision to trade a second round pick for the guy, because I think that, the, again, mm -hmm. extremely inconsistent tools notwithstanding, but. When is the next time the Steelers are going to be in position to get a quarterback with this type of potential? And I know potential is a really scary word when you're talking about a, a quarterback going into year four. I, I recognize that as well. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 tough. I mean, you're you're right. I mean, we're we're not expecting that to happen like in the drafting high. At least like that just yeah. that probably isn't going to happen. They're going to have to either as, hit. That's how you get guys like, like that, though. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. But you like, you got to move up in the draft. Yeah, I, I know it's an anomaly too, but like the Chiefs were coming off losing to the Steelers in the playoffs when they traded up for Mahomes. Yep. Like and you're gonna have to take a big swing up. eventually. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. Like you're gonna have to take a big swing, and I, I wouldn't necessarily call a second round pick a big swing. Like, is it a, a significant investment? Like, yeah, I mean it's a sizable investment. A second round pick's nothing to sneeze at. Um, but I just think that some some people are kind of blowing the compensation because here's the deal: like if fields hit and again the odds of him hitting are worse than not right like i don't think you would put the odds yeah. over 50 percent at this point but if no. fields did hit nobody gives a crap about the no. second round pick like the, having a quarterback uh for the next you know 10 years or whatever is significantly more valuable than whatever that second round pick could potentially come be so um I know we said we didn't want to spend a lot of time on the quarterbacks. We just talked about quarterbacks yeah, for 18 minutes. Um, so let's move on to some different uh, positional um, discussions here. Um, I do want to answer this Corey Trice question, but I want to start off with mm. some um, like free agency stuff. Greatest collab of all time. Appreciate you, Kyle. That's really nice. <laughs> um, James Williams from Miami. You watched him yet? There's a, a couple questions in here on him. I saw that he was in here, so I I haven't like I, I'm not going to pretend that I have. I mm -hmm. have a couple of games downloaded now to watch, but I have not. So that would be all you if you're talking about James Williams. Yeah, so James Williams, uh, I watched both of the Miami guys two weeks ago. Him and Cam Kitchens. Uh, I think Kitchens mm -hmm. gets drafted first. Uh, Kitchens may end up end up being the first safety off the board, in my opinion. Uh, but as far as James know. Williams. Um, I absolutely love the way that that dude plays. I mean, from a mentality, from a demeanor standpoint, everything that you want in a defensive back or linebacker, you know, he bulked up to, I think, around 230 uh, to get right for the senior bowl in Mobile, worked out with the linebackers and positional group uh, drills. I'm interested to see. I didn't look at the combine uh, availability thing to see if he was listed in the DBs or linebackers yet. I should have done that before I jumped on. But um, this dude, like, I do think that he has the necessary athleticism uh, to go sideline to sideline if you want to move him in the box. I kind of have pictured him as this kind of pseudo dime linebacker type, um, yeah. but I know that people are kind of mocking him in the like late third, early day three range. I think that that is a fine range to draft like a 
fifth defensive back type or kind of specialized role player. Um, I think he'd be really good on special teams too. The dude hits like a freaking missile. And I actually do think that he has relatively good eyes, uh, not just for the safety position, but just in general. I do think he's a pretty smart player. Um, click and close ability, all that stuff. I just think like the reason why I think most people are kind of scared with him at safety is um, there are just some concerns in terms of like fluidity and coverage. Uh, I do think that like he could match up with bigger body types, but he's not the guy that you're going to want to get in space with some of these receivers at the next level. So that's kind of my short cliff notes version um, on James, um, James yeah. Williams. I mean, so I saw him when I was watching Cam Kitchens, but like it wasn't in depth, obviously. So mm -hmm. like on my radar to watch. And then I saw, we got two questions on him. And I was like, okay, all right, yeah, let me go see how many games I can get of this guy. So, yeah, I got a uh, versus Texas A&M versus Clemson and versus Florida State to watch. But yeah. um, the other question that mentioned him also asked about Mason Smith, the defensive lineman at LSU. I do think that he is one of those guys like mid-round that I would say – I'm not going to say the exact same way that he felt like a stealer to me, but like we talked last year about like Dexter or Benton. Like I could mm -hmm. definitely see Mason Smith by draft day us being like, yeah, this guy – seems like he's going to be a stealer. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, there's been a lot of discussion, I feel like, on that as far as, um, you know, what the Steelers are going to do at the defensive line position. You know, they've got some question marks in terms of, you know, uh, for example, you know, Cam Hayward's been very active on social media about the contract stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Larry Ogunjobi kind of disappointing a little bit. Keanu Benton had a really good rookie season. I know you're probably just as big of a fan of his uh, as I am. But, you know, they're going to need a depth piece. Um, you know, it's probably not the top of the priority list just because, you know, the Steelers yeah. have all these different needs where, like, you could envision them starting as a rookie. It's kind of hard to see a defensive lineman starting as a rookie if Ogunjobi, Hayward, and Benton are all back, right? Like, it's it's sure. difficult. But yeah. but they absolutely well, do need need depth at that spot mm -hmm. now you know it, it, say they didn't expect like mason cool i think you could have even made the case to not cut and bring back as a backup even if you were going to go a different direction mm -hmm. that with them doing that like I, I wonder if we do see any more like surprises like we've talked about larry and joby's contract is there you know a path to him not being on the roster next year and if that's the case i mean yeah they could add one even earlier than we're thinking like even if they go out in free agency and sign a guy that could potentially be a starter like maybe they invest in the draft more heavily than we think they're going to and like mm -hmm. when i watch mason smith i see a little bit of like that bet and cross chop that he that he brings to the table that club move um he's got a violent spin like there's some things that he does that make me think like this guy's definitely athletic enough to play out to like the four i five um yeah, like I, I, I love the fit. I don't know if there's going to be like a pick that lines up to do it. Like, would that be at 84 they had to in your mind or like? Yeah, I I, I feel like I don't know where they have him right now on the consensus consensus. Yeah, um, like could board. they get away with it being one of those back to back fourths? Is yeah, basically my question. That's kind of the range that I feel like if they're going to okay. take a defensive lineman, that's probably where mm -hmm. I would say as currently constructed with the three guys we talked about being back. Um you know, I mean, I will say this about Smith, though, like career high in terms of pressures last season. So, like, he definitely took a step yeah. forward as a pass rusher. Um, just looking at his pro, pro football focus numbers, 23 pressures, three sacks. So, um, definitely an improvement over where he was the year prior or the two years prior at LSU. Um, you know, Gabe Hall was another guy that I've kind of brought up a little mm -hmm. bit a couple times. Tyler Davis, another really uh, intriguing piece out of Clemson. Guy who really flashed as a freshman. He was somebody that I thought was going to be, like, the next great Clemson defensive lineman. Um, you know, his name, his nickname is they call him baby Dex because uh, pretty much Clemson dubbed him as like the next Dexter Lawrence. Like that's wow. that's the type yeah. of rep that he kind of came in with. And he that's even loftier than I expected you to say, because I thought you were to say, like, maybe be the next Brian Brzee. Yeah, them. no, no, but, they yeah. they were they were extremely <laughs> high on him. And like yeah. even as a freshman, I remember watching this dude live and I was like, oh, my God, this kid is he's 18. Like, there's no way. And then he, you know, stays for like five, six years because, you know, he ran into some injury problems, had some other stuff go on. Um, mm -hmm. but he's a guy who I think, you know, I still, I thought that this year was his best year in like a year or two where like, I did see some of the athletic traits that I saw early in his career before the injury, he'd be an intriguing guy to take a, uh, kind of flyer on, but, um, just next question, uh, from lukewarm Steelers fan. I know this dude comments on a lot of my stuff and I think he supports the channel as well. So I definitely want to get to this yeah. one. Um, if Mims, he's talking about Amarius Mims, right tackle from Georgia and Powers Johnson are there at 20, who would you take? I think this is a good question. Definitely something. I think this was also listed by someone else in this uh, thread, but I, I want your take mm -hmm. on this. 
brother, this is tough uh, because it's kind of <laughs> like play. I, I feel like you're playing a game here with, because it's it's part of a bigger plan. You know, if you take Mims at 20, what do you get in the 52? If you take Powers Johnson at 20, what do you get in the 52? Um, I mean, straight up, like I, Powers Johnson is going to be the better player from day one than Amarius Mims. You know, eight, eight starts in college, very much a question of what he is going to be at the next level. You're talking about a project here. Like we thought Broderick was going to be brought along slowly. I can't imagine that what the Steelers plan would be for Marius Mims and how early we'd see him. Um, in that same token, man, if you get your fran your franchise bookends for the next decade locked down with Project Jones and Amarius Mims, you know, it's a lot easier to find quality center play than it is quality tackle play. Um, so like for me, it's about figuring out the rest of the draft plan as well, not just pick 20. I, I wouldn't be mad about either one, but you know, I, I think that everybody can tell based off how we talk about quarterbacks and really any position that I, I'm I'm more the guy that's gonna take those swings. So I lean a Marius Mims here and getting an answer at, at both tackle spots for the next decade. Yeah, it's it's really tough, man, because I I uh I watched Powers Johnson first and I want to give my my guy Nick Martin a shout out. Um, you know, my draft pod co-host uh from you yeah know, all Steelers he was like the first person I seen on Jackson Powers Johnson uh and like he or I any other he, draft prospect yeah yeah he's always uh, first yeah and he he dm'd me about him months ago like actually like probably like early in the season and this is at mm -hmm. this point when like I think JPJ had only started a couple of games you talk about Mims like being relatively inexperienced Jackson Powers Johnson is not necessarily inexperienced but this was his first year playing center and the the, the yeah. caliber of tape that he put on display phenomenal mm -hmm. like some of the best center tape that you will see of a prospect coming out and then you talk about how clean the tape is the combination of power and athleticism unbelievable this dude's 335 pounds i honestly like when i was watching him on tape i i thought that he was like 310 315 just because the way that he moves on some of these zone run plays and gets to the second level and out in space on screens i was like this dude's a phenomenal athlete doing that at 335 is freaky i mean freaky stuff yeah. Um, and like I said, like still relatively new to the position. I think that he has a super high ceiling. Um, but speaking of high ceilings, like Amarius Mims, I mean, the, the sky, the sky is the ceiling for this kid. I mean, I honestly, and this is gonna be like, sound like a hot take or kind of like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. I think he might be less raw than Broderick was in pass pro. Like I really do. I think he's cleaner from a technical perspective than Broderick was. I think that Broderick's recovery ability and some of the special, special plays, we're a little more impressive than like Mims special plays, but that dude, like he, he's a freak, like an absolute freak. I don't think he's mm -hmm. as impactful of a run blocker as Broderick is. You know, sure, when we yeah. saw Broderick really get unlocked last season, when they started moving him and all those dart plays, pulling him across the formation, things like that. Um, you know, that was really where we saw him shine. Like he, he was an impact, an impact player from day one on the run game. We know that there are some things he's got to work on in pass bro. Now with Mims, the lack of experience is, is evident. Like in one of the things that kind of bothers me a little bit, like when he did get beat in pass pro, it was consistently like he was just getting to the wrong depth. You know, um, he was a consistent like oversetter. So he would get beat inside. And then that was kind of where I noticed the recovery ability a little bit. Like Broderick, special athlete, didn't matter. He bad technique. He's just yeah. going to out athlete everybody. Mims is a really good, at like really, really good athlete, but I don't think he's like the elite athlete that Broderick is. My answer would be power johnson i just think that like the, the tape is so clean and i legitimately see a it guy is. that could be one of the best players in at his position at the nfl level and maybe i'm just super scarred i don't know but i am so tired of seeing bad center play in pittsburgh i just well Kelsey's, here's the thing yeah it, it's a combination of being starred recently but also having such special center play prior to yeah like, we've had both yeah, hundred yeah. percent. It's it's a it's a bad combination from a fan perspective, or for someone who's like studied and watched the team over the years. Yeah. Um, it's like going from Ben to Kenny Pickett. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Um, <laughs> but like, dude, it's uh, it's it's so hard because you know Pouncey's last year, and then the Kendrick Green experience, and then you know Mason Cole, like who was absolutely terrible last year. It's just I want that. I just want that feeling of okay, we got this position figured out for the next ten years. And I know that's a yeah. bad way to like evaluate prospects because as much as I love Powers Johnson, there is no such thing as uh, perfect prospects. Even though I think his tape is extremely clean, he I he's think not he's the sure. center version of like Marvin Harrison Jr. Like yeah, I think that it's that clean. Yeah, it it really is. 
it's not a sure thing, but it's just like, I just want to get that, get the pivot figured out, man. I don't have to worry about it for the next 10, 15 years. And, and that's just kind of where, where I fall with it. But I do think it's a really interesting hypothetical. I think it's interesting too. A lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the teams around the Steelers and the draft order, like need centers now. Like you look yeah. at, um, like, I think Jacksonville really needs to look at a center. Miami's an interesting one to look at a center, maybe Seattle, like a lot of these teams that are picking around them. Um, kind of are in the center market as well. So we'll see how free agency and all that stuff plays out, but definitely a good um, kind of a good uh, segue. Let's go on here. Um, this is a good question from Minka's goat. Uh, if the Steelers don't side Snead or Johnson, who would be the next best cornerback to target in free agency? Um, you know, I, I think it's going to be like a pick your flavor type thing. Like Kendall Fuller could definitely make sense. Obviously would fill that, that nickel role for them. Um, not saying he can't play outside, but I think, you know, they would probably use him inside more than anything that would leave the question is what you're doing on the boundary. I think a name to keep an eye on would be Sean Murphy bunting. who can do both. I thought he had a really nice year in Tennessee. I brought him up at the trade deadline last year as a guy to look at, even though it seemed like the Steelers were like, okay, we're only interested in Jalen Johnson, uh, yeah. the trade deadline. Um, but yeah, if it's not Snead or Johnson, uh, Sean Murphy bunting is definitely a guy that I like. Um, you know, that that's probably been the one that I circled as like makes sense, probably comes within their price range, the versatility that he offers. I think TA just makes a ton of sense for him as a defensive coordinator. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if there's a name that sticks out to you. Uh, th those are the two that I thought of. And, and Fuller, honestly, probably a little bit too expensive. I don't know if they want to do the whole, you know, he, he's, what, 29, 30? So, like, do they want to go that age route again? I'm not sure. Yeah, this is tough because, you know, I – I think Jalen Johnson is going to end up getting the franchise tag. I don't even know. They might have already said that he's getting the tag. I don't know. I haven't really been paying attention, but I just don't think Chicago lets him out of the building. Definitely not this yeah. year. I think Snead is – Them more. being able to get the deal done with Sweat was so mm -hmm. imperative because it gives them the ability to tag. To tag him, yeah. It's no, kind of like a yeah. safeguard type of thing. But, yeah, I mean, it's it's a weird cornerback market. I – it's kind of tough because, um, you know, Snead, I, I kind of just did a breakdown for Steelers now on him. He's a perfect schematic fit for what the Steelers want to do. You talk about a guy who has inside outside versatility, man coverage mm -hmm. ability, freaky athleticism, like great, uh, great transitions, great footwork, uh, explosive hands are always near the football. Um, the penalties are a little bit of concern, but you know, Joey Porter Jr. kind of has this, some of the same concerns in the back end. But he would be some guy, somebody that would immediately like lift their defense to a completely different level. But he's going to cost you a, a significant amount. Like he's going to get paid, and I don't see them yeah. making that type of splash. The problem is a lot of these other names are like zone heavy kind of corners, and like they just mm -hmm. really don't do it for me. And when I see the draft class being how impressive it is like I, I mean there's guys that there's another question in here about this that we can segue this to um but there's guys like in the third fourth round that i think can come in like relatively early in the first year or two of their rookie contract yeah. and play as starters so mm -hmm. for me it's really difficult to say like oh i want to go get um you know a guy like adory jackson you know who's 28 29 years old who has inside outside versatility but like you're probably going to end up paying him seven, eight million just to come over here for a year. That's what Pro Football Focus has him, um, you know, tagged at right now. I do like the Murphy Bunning shot. That's a good. That's a good shot. I did hear some good things uh, from some of my Titans follows. A guy that I inquired about just as kind of a, a feeler. I wanted to know. I hit up uh, a buddy of mine about Christian Fulton, uh, who had a rough yeah. season this past year, mm -hmm. but you know had flashed a little bit in the years past. Uh, Pro Football Focus don't they have him projected like one year three million so around the same kind of range as uh, yeah. Murphy Bunning so those are like those are guys that you're just you know taking a flyer on that aren't necessarily even guaranteed to make the roster uh, more mm -hmm. than anything else. Let but. me let me like a, a name like Dane Jackson who is is a free agent. We've seen him play uh, a little bit like Buffalo kind of pushed him out, but then he had to get back in because of injuries and stuff that they suffered. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, he's on the free agent market, and I'm not sure that he's like an every down starter or like a guy that you want to for sure be the starter. But when you have like a couple developmental guys already in place in Darius Rush and hopefully Corey Trice gets healthy and he can be part of the mix, too. You know, what do you think about an idea like, OK, you you get a nickel in the draft, maybe like Mike Sanger still or something wherever you draft him. Um, and then you have like those three guys all battling it out to win one job as the starting boundary opposite JPJ. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is 
it's kind of the way the Steelers typically do things, right? Like they take a yeah. really small swing in free agency as kind of like a safeguard barrier just in case, you know, whoever they draft isn't ready early on. And then, you know, they draft kind of over them. And then you normally see that guy kind of give way to the rookie, kind of like what they did with Levi Wallace, another guy from Buffalo. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, Dane Jackson, interesting player, obviously the pick connection there. So, yeah. um, you know, there's, there's some stuff there as well. Um, you know, a guy like Jordan Lewis, who's, you know, played in Dallas. He's got, you know, a lot of experience, 20, 29 years old. Like all these guys are going to be like relatively cheap um, on the market. I know a lot of people have asked about Kenny Moore. Um, you know, Moore's just yeah. played like it, it's tough for me because I do think that Moore has the the style of corner that the typical the Steelers typically like in the slot, like ability to play the run, really smart player, uh, pretty mm-hmm. impactful. I know he had a pretty good season last year, a bounce back year. Um, but he's just always really played in a heavy, heavy zone systems like Gus Bradley cover three, you know, even before that they played, um, you know, a lot of cover two over there. So it's just different. Like with the Steelers, I think really preferring to play man coverage, um, would they make a signing like that? They haven't projected pro football focus two years, 13 and a half million. That's not, that's reasonable in my opinion, but if you didn't want to yeah. spend three years, 18 million or whatever on Mike Hilton a couple years ago, like, why would you spend that on? Kenny Moore right now you know what I'm saying like I just I don't know if yeah. that would make sense in in the Steelers organization minds um we actually have a couple good segues there because I wanted to talk about um Corey Trice you brought up that name there was a yeah. uh question in here about realistic expectations for Corey Trice what are your realistic expectations for Corey Trice next season <laughs> how do you how do you have any realistic expectations for Corey Trice this is the this is the question from last year about Calvin Austin it's just mm-hmm. about Corey Trice now uh, you know, yeah. when you're a rookie and you lose your entire rookie year, I think all expectations have to be stripped. Uh, you're a lottery ticket, you know, and I think as a seventh round pick last year, he was already a lottery ticket. So uh, yeah. I don't have any expectations for Corey Trice. I had a, I had higher expectations last year for Corey. Trice. Yeah. It's just going to be really hard for him now as a second year player without a year one to show really anything um, for him to come in and be a contributor. I think if he carves out a role. Um, and this is the ideal role that I said for him, even when he came in as a rookie, as is like a, a tight end eraser, you know, how like Good Cincinnati job. used uh, flowers a couple of years ago on their Super Bowl run. Like mm-hmm. if he can carve out a role for himself uh, of that vein, I think it's a success for him at the NFL level. Like, I mean, I, I loved him as a prospect. I thought he was a third round player that they got in the seventh round. I just when you talk about a guy that's that's missed the ball that he has now, uh, he's, he's facing an uphill battle. So, yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll prop to him, but I it's it's gonna be hard for him to to do so. Yeah, and I mean, again, this is like kind of where I feel like it seems like I may be talking out of both sides of my mouth here because I was super high on Corey Trice uh, coming mm-hmm. out of the draft. You know, um, you know, I, he finished inside the top 100 for me. I want to say about like 84th or something like that on my big so board also last year. Third round. Yeah, yeah. So um, a guy that I really like, really clean film. I watched him lock up some really talented receivers when he was at Purdue. I watched him play Rashad Bateman from Minnesota when he was there extremely well. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought the Steelers got a steal. And the only reason he was available at that point was because of the medicals. And, you know, for a guy that's, you know, torn both ACLs now, I think uh, one of his ACLs multiple times. So it's just, he's just missed a lot of time and dealt with some really significant setbacks injury wise. Like you said, total lottery ticket. You cannot have a player like that factor in your decisions on how you're going to approach free agency, how you're going to approach the NFL draft. And now if he, now the good thing for Trice, I will say this one, he's talented. Like there's no doubt mm-hmm. that if he recovers yeah. 100% from a physical standpoint, he is talented enough to be a player that can contribute on this roster. The other thing I'll say that's good for him is the Steelers after Joey Porter jr. It's an open book, man. Like you could tell me, you could shout out a hundred different names as far as who's going to get playing time in the secondary next year. I'd say, all right, there's a possibility because outside of Porter, there's really yeah. not like Patrick Peterson has a really high high cap hit. There's a question on that, whether he should be brought back. We can kind of move to that after this. Um, but, you know, Le- Levi Wallace, free agent. I mean, you mentioned Darius Rush, a guy they picked up off waivers or off free agency. One of the other, I can't remember from Indy. Wa- yeah, yeah. But, I mean, we talk about just, I mean, this is a completely open slate. We expect them to add a significant piece in the draft. Like they're going to take a corner probably pr- pretty early, um, definitely by the end of day two, I would hope. Um, depending on what happens at free agency, but 
Um, you know, I, I think that, that that that's a good thing for him is the opportunity is going to be there. He will have the opportunity to carve out some playing time. It's just a matter of like, can he can he get healthy and can he stay healthy? That's that's the biggest question mark. But um, definitely rooting for Trice. Uh, I do want to get to that question about um, Patrick Peterson. You guys are doing great with the questions because you are creating like really easy segues uh, for me as a <laughs> they host. Were, they all collaborated on this. Yeah, I appreciate you guys. Uh, I'll find the question. But basically, the question, uh, in essence, was, do you feel like Patrick Peterson's worth bringing back at his current cap hit? Um, and then we can talk a little bit about, um, you know, where, you know, he should play or what, what your thoughts on that or his, you know, value heading into the next season. Uh, well, short answer, no. I, I don't think you can bring him back at what he is set to make. I do like the idea of Patrick Peterson still being on the roster, and I don't know if I'm in the minority with that, but it's not as a set, not in a set position. Like I would move him around similarly to what I think that they envisioned doing with him. Obviously, he at times had to be a safety or had to be a corner because of other things on the roster. But if you can get your roster into a place, if you can go out and find a strong safety and free agency to pair with Minka, if you can draft a, you know, a boundary corner or draft a slot, whatever it might be, and be able to move Patch Peterson around, uh, limit how many times he actually has to play in man, clearly that's those years are beyond him. Uh, mm -hmm. His best asset now is you know above the neck, his mind and his, his eyes, his ability to read quarterback's eyes. Um, and I still think that there's value there for that perspective and also just continuing to groom along Joey Porter Jr. and whoever this corner is that we're talking about bringing into the organization. So I still think he does add value, not at the number that he is set to come back on. I do think I think they're going to find a way to to bring him back, whatever that looks like, maybe a, a one year extension in, in you know, reducing the cost for this year, whatever that looks like. Um, but, yeah, I, I do expect him to be in the 2024 roster and I'm OK with it. Yeah, this is a really difficult conversation. I feel like my heart really wants him back because Peterson was my my favorite mm -hmm. like college football players of all time. I was super jacked, man. Even even like late career Peterson, I was really jacked when they signed him last year. Just from a like almost like fanboy perspective, like that was a guy who when I was coming up, like that was one of the guys I loved to watch. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that you make a good point. A lot of Peterson's value, I feel like at this point is from an intangible perspective, you know, the mental makeup, the like his football cues, top, top notch, um, you know, what he could provide in terms of insight, teaching, coaching to the younger guys on the roster is invaluable. Having the ability to play at least in a pinch, multiple different positions, I think provides value. The The question of that is what type of value does it provide from a financial standpoint? Because it, it's, it's all sure. a numbers game, right? Like he has a mm -hmm. uh, an over, I think it's like eight something million dollar cap hit. I'm trying to look right now. Oh, 9.7. So I thought, I, was, I thought it was more close to 10. So. Yeah. So like, I mean, that's a lot to spend on a, I mean, I think at this point we both probably agree. He's definitely no more than a role player at this point. So mm -hmm. you're allocating a lot of your salary cap money to a guy that you really don't want on the field probably every snap now my preference and this is something that uh we mentioned a little bit with trice i think that peterson's body type with the length and just the size and everything he could be a guy that they could use in terms of matching up with tight ends i thought some of the best ball that he played last year was honestly out of the slot which i was honestly a little bit worried about just because of some of the quicker change of direction guys and they still gave him a little bit of trouble, like you said, in man coverage. But I think mm -hmm. if you're talking about giving him a significant amount of snaps, that's probably where it's going to have to come from. His safety tape, I know a lot of people uh, – like, I want to commend the effort for him coming in just basically on the fly and playing safety. I mean, that's just not – that's not easy to do at the NFL level for somebody that's never done it before. The, to me, the tape was overrated. Like, people was really gassing up, like, how good his tape was at safety. And I just don't see a – I don't see a long-term transition there because he doesn't tackle well enough. That's and I don't think that he he had to tackle a hell of a lot better than he did. That yeah. He doesn't tackle well yeah. enough. And I just don't think that he has at this stage of his career, like the type of range, even if I really like, you know, the above the next stuff, the, the playmaking ability. I just don't think he has mm -hmm. this type of range to consistently play, you know, center field, but um, a lot of good questions there. Um, let's see what we got next. Uh, I feel like some of these are repeat questions about what, what would you do on day one of the draft? I think we, we talked a little bit about that. Um, are there any other like names that you just kind of want to throw in the first round kind of mix uh, with that? Like a Mary Smith, um, Jack Spires Johnson, like maybe guys that yes. people aren't necessarily talking about right now or, or think that you deserve more love. Mm, I mean, these names have been mentioned too, but like Tyler Guyton, 
Um, I would like to throw out Fuaga. I just think he's going to go a lot higher. Like, I think he's like the floor is probably like 14 ish to me. Insane, insane, insane run blocker. Insane. Yeah. And how awesome would he be for Arthur Smith? I mean, man, yeah, that's like the perfect fit for me. Um, but I think he's going to go too high. We haven't talked about the idea. Like we were talking about corners, but like the idea of one of them going around one, like Quinion Mitchell to me would be certainly a guy. I think he's going to be an option if he's on the board. Uh, is he going to be on the board? Like, I'm curious to see, I would love to know at the end of the process, you know, and I know that you would too, and this it's, we're never going to have this be the case, but it would be awesome if it did where teams had to, tell everybody hey this is what our boards look like because i want to <laughs> yeah. know how teams cornerback rankings are going to shake out this year because like for me i still have terry and arnold number one but like quinion mitchell definitely made a push the more that i was able to get of him um like he he obviously had a really good senior boy everybody was talking about him and i was like man who is this guy i gotta get more film on him um and just watch like the ball skills are there i think the biggest question was how is he going to look against you know better competition obviously coming out of toledo he wasn't mm-hmm. seeing high profile names week in and week out but he answered the bell at the senior bowl i think he would be in play at 20 um hmm. and then probably like some random player that like we're not even thinking of Uh, let me ask you, do you think there's a chance that they would take a receiver? See, I, I I say no right now, but I do think that there is enough smoke or I don't even want to call it smoke. There, there's enough of a chance that Deontay Johnson, it would obviously, I was say it would obviously be with a Deontay yeah, trade. I mean, we don't even know what that is. I, I know I tweeted this the other day. I kind of just, I'm so tired of every offseason having to like discuss these hypotheticals with Deontay. And it's not even really anything <laughs> that like he's doing. It's just, I feel like half the fan, like most of the fan base just like does not appreciate like his skill set and just like wants, they want him to be a B and like he's just not that. Yeah. So like it's almost like people aren't going to be satisfied um, until like he's gone or whatever. Now, if, if in these hypotheticals that everybody likes to throw out, like if he does get traded, like for some type of like, there probably wouldn't be able to get much more like than like maybe a late second, third round pick for him like at the most. Cause like he's, he's going to be a free agent next season. So, I mean, mm-hmm. he's, he's on the last year of his contract. So the team that would be acquiring him doesn't have like long-term control unless they extended him before the season. Um, You know, you would be put pushing yourself into like need to take a receiver. Now there's a lot of guys that I like, and this receiver class is absolutely insane. There's, I mean, even down, like we talked about the corners being able to find starters in round three and four, you can do the same thing with receivers. Um, like I want to touch a little bit on Fuaga because I, I have gotten a l- around a yeah. little bit more of his tape since I did the last like Q&A on the channel. Um, like I said, insane run blocker. Like the dude is powerful, stays connected, runs his feet, plays with good pad level. The only thing with Fuaga to me, I think in most systems, I think he's a guard just because there are some worrisome habits and pass protection. One, like, he does play with the independent hand usage, but he's really heavy on his outside hand. He gets his outside hand swiped like with these. Like you go back and watch like Oregon game, UCLA, like Latu Latu got him a couple times. Um, they're just like he creates some short corners in pass protection. And like that would be the thing that worries me. But in a system like Arthur Smith, where you're going to be moving the launch point, we're going to be doing heavy, heavy yeah. play action. Obviously, the zone run game, like he's a glove like fit. Um, if they picked him at 20, like, like even if I have some concerns about like, you know, him holding up in pass protection or some things that he has to work on in terms of getting depth and, you know, proper depth in the pocket. Um, I definitely think that's the system where you can get the most out of him because a lot of the things like I, I did a video uh, today, we're recording this on Sunday, dropped a video today on the center position. Uh, a guy like Aaron Brewer uh, at the center position where, yeah. you know, he is a literal perfect fit for what you would want at the center position for this type of offense in the zone run blocking game. But in pass protection, you're going to have to protect him. Like, there are just things that he's going to struggle with, and you have to understand that. Now, Fuaga, not a finished product, whereas Brewer, you know, been in the league for three or four years now. You kind of know what you're going to get. But, um, you know, th- those are really interesting conversations as far as, like, where they're going to go with the offensive line, what they prioritize. Yeah. Um, I did think Chris brought up a, a good question right here. Uh, if we're in a position to grab a later round quarterback, who do you like? I really like Cam Hart and Kyrie Jackson. Those are the two guys that I literally pointed out, um, <laughs> like – Last time I jumped on the uh, on here and did a QA, and a and then I mocked, uh, I think, Cam Hart to the Steelers in my mock draft for Steelers now in the third round. So those are two guys I really like. Cam Hart's a guy that I've been on the bandwagon for, for since, like, coming into 2022. Um, so he's a guy that I really like. You got any, like, mid-round type cornerbacks that you really like that you watched? Uh, yeah, yet? also, 
also, this isn't a mid round guy, but I just an, another answer for me at 20, and it's Wright Straw Jr. Because okay. I think if you're looking for a pairing to Joey Porter Jr., if you're looking for another guy very similar to Joey Porter, like if there's a Joey Porter Jr. in this class, I think it's Ennis Wright Straw Jr. Yeah. Um, bringing up his teammate, Chris Abrams Drain, I think that could potentially be a guy if you're looking at like a round three. Like I, to me, this question is about which cornerback at about pick 84 do you like? Because I think yep. that's where they would take either one of these two guys and Cam Hart or Kyrie Jackson. Big fan of both those guys. Cam Hart was another uh, senior bowl guy, really stood out there. Um, but like, you know, to me, there's a little bit of variance in his play. And this kind of goes back to like the big swing thing, right? Like this could be a guy that is, you know, a decade long starter on the boundary, or we're going to see him get burnt a lot and be talking about him like, oh, great. We got another Artie Burns. There's a lot of variance in his play, not even just from like a play to play basis, but like a game to game basis. Um, but yeah. the highs are very high for him. Kyrie Jackson out of Oregon. I really like to. Um, long, pack- long, long. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, these pack 12 corners scare me a bit, but, uh, I definitely really like Tyree Jackson. The tape's good. Um, yeah. I mean, those three are the names that popped in, into mind to me. The question that I have, man, is based off so far what we're seeing off, you know, the pre draft here. And again, we still got the combine. We still got a lot, a lot of stuff that's going to happen before the draft that can tell these guys stories is the fall of Kalen King. Is it going to be real? Like, is he going to be a name that we're potentially talking about as a guy that they can get in round three? And would you even be interested? Yeah, I mean, so here's the deal. Like, coming into the year, Kalen King was a guy that I was lower on the consensus. Okay. Having watched a ton of Joy Porter Jr. tape, I was kind of exposed to King a, a lot. All right. So some of the issues with King, I just don't think – I think – there was just way too much projection with him and with his evaluation. Um, I do think that there are some really impressive athletic traits, but the tape's just really bad. Like, like not really, really bad, like undraftable bad, but the tape is a guy that you would take like somewhere in the middle rounds. Like it's just not, yeah, it didn't like, match the, the first round player that it looked like he was going to be. Yeah. It's just it, like, yeah. honestly, like I found myself this summer, disappointed and then when i went back and watched like two games i think so far i haven't watched admittedly very much of him i watched his matchup with marvin harrison jr and like mm-hmm. it's marvin harrison jr and you know i think that you know he's a guy who could probably step into the nfl tomorrow and be a top 15 receiver at the position so like there is that but there's a lot of guys that move like harrison at the next level and how are you gonna end up competing with that because he didn't compete like last like honestly harrison yeah. jr if he had a better quarterback like he could have put up like 15 for 250 probably on him. I don't know what he finished the day with, but he was open like nonstop. Um, another guy that I really wanted to point out, um, Renardo Green from Florida State. Like a guy I, that I'm, I'm literally sitting here going through, and I was like, let me mention one more. That's fine. I was I, yeah. I was gonna have to squeeze that in. So let's get it on the same page. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Nick Fairball, I kind of asked him about uh him a little bit. Like he was tweeting about him uh having a good trombo, and then I finally got to his tape. Uh Played really well against LSU guys, Brian Thomas Jr. and Malik Neighbors. Uh, you know, really competitive kid, like competitive, competitive kid. Loves the press. Um, I'm very inter- interested to see what he he's going to run. I think if he runs well, um, you know, his stock is somebody that's going to be going up because I do think that he has tape, uh, pretty solid tape in terms of the two games that I yeah. watched of him. Uh, his teammates, a guy that a lot of people like. I think his name is Jerry and Jones. I have not watched him, uh, but those are just some names kind of throw out there. Um, you know who, if you consider, he's listed as a safety, but like Ty T. Smith might be a nickel in the NFL. Yeah, he, he's a nickel, I think. It, yeah, I, I would think so. And like if you're lumping nickels into this bucket in terms of mid-round corners, uh, he, he would be a guy that, because man, like if, if the Steelers are looking for another Mike Hilton, that, that could be Mike Hilton right there. I will, yes, the, there is a lot of, the only thing I don't like about Tyke Smith, I, like besides the medical stuff, like he, there was there he's yeah. dealt with some injuries, um, mm-hmm. you know. But I do one thing that I do. I'll start with what I do like. You talk about Mike Hilton. This dude is a pit bull. Like plays the run exceptionally well. I've watched this dude take on blocks and set the edge and get the ball carrier back to his teammates against offensive tackles that outweigh him by over a hundred pounds. He is a tough sob. One of the things that does worry me about Smith, though. He's a smart player in coverage. He's physical, but he's grabby. And that's something that really bothers me a little bit uh, because I watched his game against Florida this morning because I was uh, watching a receiver that I really like that I'll have an article up on in the morning. Um, but 
I watched that game and man, there's just there's so many times where he's playing in a trail position by design, but he's grabbing at the shoulder pads. And like they let you get away with that in college because you know they just allow defensive backs to be more physical at the next level. You put your hand on somebody is it's a flag over five yards down the field. So that would be my only concern. One guy that I will like, I will say, just throw out another, you know, slot capable guy, but also could fill the uh, safety position role. Javon Bullard from Georgia. If you have yeah. not watched this dude play, I I've been a mm -hmm. fan since last summer, man. But that dude, you talk about somebody that I would stand on a freaking table for and just beg my organization to draft him. That's the dude. I the dude plays, he plays football the right way, like super versatile, super smart. Will hit the crap out of you. I think he's got good coverage ability, good range in the back end. Like I said, he's played nickel, uh, the star position at Georgia. He's played safety, so you know he's got experience at both those spots. Um, I really like Javon Buller. He's a guy. If if he was to be available at like eighty four, that's a sprint up to the podium. I don't think he should be, but that's a sprint to the podium type of pick uh, for me personally. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, do they draft Taylor or the punter from Iowa? My guy Ryan getting in some punter questions. I love that. Uh, I think I've seen the the punter from Iowa mocked in the fourth round. I'm I'm Dude, fine with drafting yeah. a punter. I'm normally not. I'm normally anti drafting a specialist. I'm okay with it this year just because of how shallow the draft class is. We've got a record low number of underclassmen in this class. After like the fourth round, this this draft just takes a complete nosedive. I've just been going back and looking at like the consensus board and stuff it's tough to find guys after the fourth round that I'm, I'm really, really interested in. Um, so this would be a draft that I would be willing to take a punter. Are you anti, I just want to know, like not specifically about the punter from Iowa, but are you anti punter in the draft or anti specialist or, or are you cool with that? No, I'm, I'm cool with it. I mean, I, you know, the idea of, of drafting Presley Harvin certainly didn't scare me away from do, them doing it in the future. Mm, sure. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, where would where they'd have to draft Taylor? Probably not, you know, with everything else that I think they got to check the boxes for. Um, but in general, like if they used a seventh round or something on one, that's completely fine with me. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree as well. Um, we'll get to a couple more and then we got to got to head out here. We're rolling on an hour. So this is kind of like my stopgap portion. Um, I'm just wondering, this is a good question from uh, Philip. Uh, what are your thoughts on off-ball linebackers? I like Wilson, Colson, and Gray. What are your thoughts? I pick 84 for one of these guys. I like Cooper, but he seems like an edge to me in the league. Do you have any thoughts on the off-ball linebackers? Not really sure if you've had the chance to kind of watch any of those guys yet. I've watched Edger and Cooper, and, you know, I, I think the, the edge stuff is interesting. I think you can use him there. I'm not saying he's like Micah Parsons, but, mm -hmm. like, I think there are going to be teams that try to utilize him um, – not close to Mikey even, but like in a, in a variety of roles similarly. Um, but I definitely think that he can still do, you know, the off ball stuff uh, as opposed to playing off the edge. Um, is this Peyton Wilson? Cause I love Peyton Wilson. The, the, I think yeah. that the question with him, right. Is there's not really a blueprint for a guy like that, you know, like at his size, his athleticism, like there's just, there's not somebody that we've seen do it in the league. Um, Cedric Gray, love him as well. Junior Colson is the one here that met, that's met, that has mentioned uh, that I have not watched yet. Um, yeah. But yeah, Edrin Cooper is the one that I've watched the most of. I'm actually going to have a YouTube video on my channel this week on him. Um, Peyton Wilson is my favorite of the group. Um, and Cedric Gray, I love too. Like, what are my thoughts about picking one at 84? <sighs> that's tough because you know, I think that there's the need there for the Steelers to finally get a long term solution for sure. And like, you look at the room that's coming back next year, you know, Cole Holcomb off an injury, Elan and Roberts, man, I, I love that guy. Yeah. Like, maybe one the of best my favorite players to watch, yeah, one of my yeah. favorite players to watch for the Steelers last year, 100%. Man. Yeah, I, I I fell in love with him very early in his Steelers career. Just felt like, man, why wasn't this guy here? Should much have been here five years this. ago, man. Um, but you know, you got him coming back. Mark Robinson, I've kind of given up on the idea of him having like at least a, a significant role on this mm -hmm. team. And then you just had a bunch of stopgap guys. I don't know if there's going to be. I wouldn't imagine much interest in bringing Quan Alexander back. Anytime you sign a guy to a one year deal and then they suffer a season any injury, how often oh, is it those guys? Which sucks because I thought Quan uh, Quan did provide some value. He did, man. All three of the, when those three guys were all, you know, healthy, it seemed like it started off very rough against San Fran, mm -hmm. but 
those guys really seemed to find their roles and it seemed like everything was kind of humming along and then back to back weeks, you so know, it Cole and Quan suffer season ending injuries. Um, I, I can't, because of everything else, it kind of goes back to like, even the idea of taking a specialist early, uh, you know, where you'd have to get like uh, Taylor, the punter. Uh, I, I don't know if I can justify 84 for it. Like I'd rather see them uh, kick the can for another year at linebacker. Um, yeah. I guess that's my answer. I, I don't love it, but yeah, it's, it's tough too. Cause like you, you mentioned, you know, Quan having that injury, like Cole Holcomb yeah. also serious mm-hmm. injury come up, trying to come mm-hmm. back from, you know, uh, Landon Roberts. We if both those love. guys, if, if Cole Holcomb didn't get hurt, if Land if Land, Landon Roberts got hurt too, like he's coming off injury, even though he was playing yeah. through it, uh, sure. and Quan didn't suffer an injury and there was like, okay, maybe the idea that he could be brought back. This isn't even a question to me, but like it, it, the, the thought is there. I'm just not doing it. Yeah, I agree. I, I think I want to give a shout out because I've I've hammered this name on Twitter for the last couple of weeks. Actually, I guess it may be longer than that. I don't know. Cedric Gray is one of my guys in this class. I really like Cedric Gray's yeah. tape. Uh, I watched mm-hmm. him, you know, before the Senior Bowl. I put him on my watch list. He was a guy that really popped out on film for me. I went in with very little knowledge of him. Uh, he was not somebody that I'd watched or really was familiar with at all. Uh, but excellent tape. Uh, I think it's really impressive. Uh, you talk about a guy who's well built. He's like 230, 235 pounds, has really good proportional length to him. Uh, really good athlete. Like, I think he's honestly really solid in coverage. Like, he understands the depth uh, of routes that he needs to get to. Zone coverage can spy drop. He's a playmaker. I think he finished a season. I want to look and see. I know he had at least a couple of interceptions last season um, over the or over the course of his career. I want to say like five picks, seven forced fumbles. Yeah, five interceptions, eight PBUs. So, like, this is a guy who can play in coverage. He can play in space. Really rangy player. Like I said, the length, I think, shows up when he's asked to take on blocks. That's something that I really watch for. I also think he's a good processor. Like, one of the really big problems with drafting linebackers, especially, like, early, while the NFL has such a hard time identifying guys at this spot, is all the things that they're asked to do at the next level are completely different than what they're asked to do at college. And just eye discipline and processing speed are so, so important for that position. And it's just really difficult to find complete linebackers. You mentioned Peyton Wilson. Mm-hmm. Uh, his tape's awesome. Like, he he's a very, very good player. I just I, – I want to say that I heard on a podcast, and don't quote me, but I want to say Dane Brugler said that he had suffered like six career – or career – six season-ending injuries dating back to high school. I mean, dude, like, what do you do? Like – what what is yeah. what are his medicals going to look like? How many teams are going to just completely take him off the board? I mean, it's it's really difficult to uh, it, it it's impossible to gauge like where he could potentially go because I think if you watch I, I watched a couple games early in the cycle before the Senior Bowl, I'm like I mean if there's anybody who can go top fifty in this class, I, I don't think the off ball linebacker class just from what I've seen is very good, but he's a guy that if you're talking about taking top fifty, like he has the tape for it, but. I just don't know what the mm-hmm. medicals are going to be. And that's that's really scary. And for the Steelers, who already have multiple guys coming off of season-ending injuries and just the lack of depth already, I don't I don't know if – can you take a gamble like that? I mean, 84 is not – that's not, you know, throwing a first-round pick on somebody where it's just – you're taking a huge risk. But I just don't know if that's a leap that I'm wanting to make. And I just think the Steelers have – I would like to add an off a linebacker if they have more draft capital. I just don't think that they have – they don't they have too many other needs or guys or other positions i'd like to see them address first um washington <clears throat> has two second round picks mm-hmm. they're going to take they're going to take edger and cooper in the second round okay dan quinn dan quinn is there now i think like i said he's going to think i can use this guy a little bit like micah parsons yeah um man i one thing i'll say about cooper when I, I was watching him, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. One thing that I noticed about Cooper, you talk about somebody that can absolutely fly. The way that they used him was really fun. I, I think that Texas, uh, Texas A&M had some interesting ideas with him. He, they used him as a spy. I noticed they mm-hmm. basically had him shadowing uh, Jaden Daniels and Jalen Miller. So like when they were playing mobile quarterbacks, they almost used him as a spy, but they were moving around the formation. So you almost didn't know where he was at. And then he would pop out of the formation. And then when one of the quarterbacks would break the pocket, he was able to run with Daniels and Daniels can, Daniels can really scoot. Like he's a four or five guy, hundred percent at least. So um, 
Yeah, he's an interesting rusher. I do think that he has some pass rush upside. I just don't know about the full time edge rusher, um, you know, thing. But um, interesting hypotheticals. Just going through some other, uh, like I said, we gotta we gotta bounce up out of here. But um, what do you Mason think about Jordan Cole, White? Though. What'd you say? There was there was two things about Mason Cole. So I feel like we should answer about the second. Okay. Uh, just real quick, Colin. What do you think about Jordan Whitehead, Geno Stone? I'm about to do a safety <laughs> video. So uh, there's going to be a safety video on the channel for free agent, free agent. Options. Also, so I mean, can he have picked that. two? Can he have picked two different players? Like <laughs> Gina yeah. Stone and Jordan Whitehead are two very yeah. different players. Just, just a little bit different. But I do think like that. That is one of the interesting questions. I guess we can kind of talk about that right now. Here's the question on Mason Cole from from my guy John. Uh, John mm-hmm. supports a lot of my stuff too, so I definitely want to answer that. Um, but I do think it's a good question about what are they going to do at safety and how are they going to prioritize the position because. Like what do they want? What do they want from Minka? I have a take. What's up? They shouldn't even think about drafting a safety. Okay. I mean, I, I don't necessarily. I disagree. think. I think because of like the two names just mentioned, Jordan Whitehead and Geno Stone. By the way, I'm gonna set Geno Smith right there. Um, mm-hmm. they are just a very small part of this safety free agent class. It mm-hmm. might be the best group of free agency the safeties so deep ton of starters out there with everything else that the Steelers need to check off this off season. I don't think that you can convince me that they should use a draft pick at safety with what's there in free agency. So, so here's, here's another thing that I'll say. We just talked, got done talking about off ball linebackers, right? Safety Mm -hmm. is another position just like off ball linebacker where the NFL just does not value those spots very much. And Mm -hmm. you can almost do this like, rent a player thing once an off season and pick up one or two of these guys. Now you may not get a guy that has a extremely robust skill set where he can do it all, but you can find these kind of niche guys where they can fill a very specific role on your defense, be a complimentary or auxiliary piece. Um, kind of like what the Steelers did last season, picking up Quan Alexander, Landon Roberts, you know, think about Landon Roberts, for example, very skill set specific type of player. You know what you're getting with him. He is a downhill thumper type but he costed them basically nothing. And he was able to provide like real, real value on defense. And then if you just look at like what the NFL has been paying, you know, you look at the spots on defense where like the, even with the free agency or even with the salary cap exploding, like going up and whatever, we have not seen a rise really in safety contracts, slot Mm -hmm. corner and off ball linebacker. The NFL just has not valued those positions very much. And that's why you talk about like, hey, don't draft one. Just go sign a guy for really cheap and, you know, just rent a player. You know, I think that that's a really good point. Sign Um, Julian Blackman for a few million dollars. Yeah, just call it a day, right? And let Minka get out of the box. Yeah, I think I think that's the that's the thing. Are you like they do have to make a decision is Minka the chess piece that they're going to continually just move around all the time? Is he going to go back to being a primary center fielder? Are they going to play more in the slot? That to me, I would rather figure out what do they think makes the defense the best? What spot makes them the best? Put him in that spot and then build the other complementary pieces around that rather than who do we like in free agency? And we'll put Minka wherever else we don't have a a guy for uh, or assigned to that position. So I think, um, you know, that's just my take on it. I would like to see me be back more in center field next season. That's just my opinion. Absolutely. Um, but uh, one more question, and then we'll we'll bounce up out of here. With Mason Cole being cut, do you think it's more or less likely the Steelers go center in round one? Would it be more ideal to go OT in round one and hope you get Zach Frazier, for example, in round two? I'll let you take that last question. Well, it's <clears> almost <throat> like, uh, geez, the way I started out with that cadence, I must went right into mid-typer. Um, <laughs> just have it for you, right? <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think it goes into the, one of those first questions that we answered about pick 20 and like, you're, you're kind of mapping out a draft plan and it's, do you take the center at 20, uh, and, and you really don't know what you're left with at 52 or do you take something else at 20 and hope like a Zach Frazier is there at 52 or do they like guys further down the board than Zach Frazier, Cedric Van Pran? Uh, I wasn't all that impressed with, uh, with the Arkansas center. What, what's it? How is it pronounced? I don't know because I haven't center. watched him yet. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, but I, I have not watched. Some him people yet. have him like in the top five. Graham Barton, I think, is a good player out of Duke, and he would be a center for the Steelers, even though he played tackle there. I think he's going to be a center. He's going to be a center guard. He's not going to, or 
possibly going to be. He's going to be a center guard in the NFL. Yeah. Um, I would say the ideal scenario is just for sure to hit on one of these. It's funny because like I just mentioned earlier that I would take Mims over Powers Johnson, but like if you can guarantee me that both 20 and 52 are going to hit, I would be fine with Powers Johnson at 20. That's just the question. Um, ideal would be offensive tackle in round one and Frazier in round two, but I don't know that Frazier gets to round two. Yeah, and that's the thing. So I've watched a couple games of Frazier, and I'm starting to see him in the past like week or two pop up in some first-round mocks. Mm-hmm. I personally do not see that caliber. Like, I do feel like there is a difference, um, a noticeable difference for me between the two top centers. Like, if you're putting Jackson Powers Johnson at one, Frazier at two, I see a difference between those two guys. Not saying that Frazier is a bad player by any means. And if he was there at 52 and the Stewart didn't take a center in round one, I could get on board with that. And I, I admittedly mm-hmm. want to do more tape watching of Frazier just individually, but I was just so blown away by Jackson Powers Johnson tape that that's why I would just 100% sprint the card up if he's there at 20 just to fill that position, not have to worry about anymore. To me, the biggest difference between the two was the athleticism. I mean, I think that Frazier's a good athlete. I think he's a functional one. I think he's, you know, an average to a little bit above average, but like Powers Johnson is a very good athlete at the position, especially like, for his you know, size. Like, yeah, very like, like Frank, right? Rag- like Frank Ragnow. Like, I, I think that Frazier, I compared a little bit to him in terms of his pass pro, but he is going to be nothing like him out in space. Like mm-hmm. to me, that's where the difference lies between the two top centers. What I will say is I, I see just as much, if not a bigger gap between my second and third centers. Yeah. So like, that's where I'm like, man if they don't get one of these two but i think that's why free agency is in play here too like i think Mm -hmm. despite cutting mason cole we know they're going to sign a veteran center of some caliber it's just they're probably also going to double double dip and find that long-term solution along with it um yeah yeah, i mean to me the the word ideal here is what makes this my answer is it's offensive tackle and then zach frazier yeah i just even if it's not in the first round i think frazier's going top 40 so like yeah I so then you're gonna have to probably you might have to trade up for him and then yeah yeah i mean it, it's definitely a difficult conversation uh just because you just never know like how other teams view him i mean it it, it doesn't sound like there's a i mean there's a greater than zero possibility that zach frazier goes round one and then you know mm-hmm. what you don't want to do and this is why i did the free agency center mm-hmm. video on the channel is you mm-hmm. don't want to pigeonhole yourself into absolutely having to take one of those two guys Because you don't know how the board's going to fall. Like somebody could fall that you just absolutely love and have a super high grade on and that you like or have graded much higher than one of those two centers, but you don't have a center. So you have to take one. Like, for example, Mm -hmm. here's here's what I would say. So, like, for example, um, say they don't do anything in free agency. They go into the draft. The only center capable players are James Daniels, who is your current starting right guard, and Mm -hmm. Nate Herbig, who's not a center or a good athlete for this scheme. You have to take a center, right? In the first two position, like first two, maybe you get by in the third round. You have to take a center early. Like what happens if, you know, JPJ and a guy like Terry on Arnold is there, but you have a, you have a way higher grade on Terry and Arnold and yeah. you need a corner too, but you've got, you've at least got other corner capable players. When you don't have that at center, that pigeon holds you into having to make that spot or, if you don't get one in round one, you're forced to trade up because out of just being scared to death that someone could take Frazier because you don't have a higher enough grade on the other centers in the class. So it's just really tough. And like you mentioned, Graham Barton, that's tough too. Cause like the stickers haven't had a ton of success with guys switching positions like that. I don't, I think it does yeah. get overplayed a little bit on Twitter, but that is just kind of the truth. Like when they've asked guys to play different positions than they played in college, how much of that is coaching? I think a significant portion of it. Um, but just over the years, they haven't had a lot of success. So you're talking about taking a guy who played left tackle at Duke, has legitimately good film, has good movement skills, good, uh, pretty good technique. I do like Graham Barton as a player, but it's tough. You're asking him to play a center spot that we really just haven't seen. And unfortunately, you know, he wasn't able to compete um, at the senior bowl in Mobile, so we didn't get to see that either. 
uh, Zach Frazier working his way back from the leg injury, but it sounds like, you know, he's going to be ready to go and he's already mm -hmm. further along in his, you know, progress than many would have anticipated. But, you know, Frazier, he's a brawler, man. Like he's a different style of player, in my opinion, than uh, Powers Johnson. Like he's a brawler. You see the wrestling background with him, like yeah. tons of knockdowns on film. He's consistently getting guys on the ground, uh, plays with excellent leverage. I just don't, to me, there was a difference between the two centers. And that, that's why if I had the opportunity, I'm going to go and, you know, take the best center available. And I think that that's JPJ. So let me let, last thing before mm -hmm. we get out of here, because of Zach Frazier first round, sure. what if it was them trading down in the first round and then drafting Zach Frazier? Like Powers Johnson was off the board, uh, you know, right before them, maybe even. And then they're like, ah, OK, well, let's trade down. Let's get out of this pick still in the first round, you pick up some extra capital, whatever that might be, and then you use the first rounder on Zach Frazier. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't think that's a, that's a terrible scenario. Like I said, for me personally, um, he was not a guy that just based on what I've seen so far that I gave a first round grade to. Now you will inevitably sure. like, there's 32 picks. I, I think anyone who does like the draft evaluation stuff, like scouts or draft media draft twitter like you don't have 32 first round grades on players it just doesn't happen yeah um so like if if they traded back to you know 27 28 something like that maybe one of those teams is coming up to get a quarterback like bo nicks or somebody like just really loves him and wants to step in front of somebody in the late first round or whatever i don't i don't know i mean it's not my favorite scenario but it's definitely one that i could you know talk myself into depending on what you got back because you know if you if you were to get back like an extra you know, an extra day two pick. Well, someone um, mentioned, let's just, let's just operate under this hypothetical. Sure. Uh, to me, to me, the chiefs are too smart to do this, but it was 32 and 64 for 20, you know, an extra second round pick 32 and 64 for 20. And yeah. maybe the chiefs are going up to get a receiver that they really like, right? Like hey, they need receiver help. Yeah. So maybe I could see myself maybe being talked into that. Um, 64 i mean yeah I, I i like it i don't I, I like it more that i guess the the money or the the pick capital works out to like a late second round pick the thing that i will say is there's a lot of guys in that range that i do particularly like as players so that would be an ability to you know we're going into free agency in the draft and i think the big question marks are you know who knows if they're going to do quarterback. That's a whole separate conversation, entirely different from everything else, in my opinion. But let's just say, um, you know, they, we know they need a corner. We know they need a tackle. We know they need a center. So that's three spots right there that they still absolutely have to address. But there's other positions, things that we've thrown, thrown around, right? Like we think they need a depth defensive lineman. We think they could potentially use an off-ball linebacker because of injuries and different things like that. They need, they don't have a third receiver on the roster right now. As once Allen Robinson gets released, which I still anticipate happening. Um, sure. So, like, there are things that you could say, like, oh, okay, if I could get an extra day two pick, that's how we address one of those other needs. Um, so there, there are some, there's some intrigue there. It's, it's not my favorite, just because I, again, I think that's personally a little bit too early. Well, 32, 32 is not like too too early i feel like for frazier I, I feel like 20 i don't i don't see him as a top 20 player right now like i could come back to this you know two months later when i've watched a little bit more of him if you know the stewards show significant interest i'll do more homework on him but he's just he just didn't look like a top 20 player to me on film but um yeah i think we we definitely went over on time <laughs> um but always, per the I think usual we always do yeah, I, I feel like that we probably need to start like blocking out an extra uh, little bit of time. But um, Zach, I really appreciate you jumping on, talking some ball with me. It's all, always um, good conversation, easy, easy flowing conversation. Uh, every time we get to chop it up, uh, tell everybody where they can find you. Uh, Zachary Smith PGH on all social media is my personal. You can find me on Steelers Afternoon Drive Monday through Friday, SteelersNow.com. Myself, Alan Saunders, Monday through Friday. That's on our YouTube channel, uh, Steelers Now Audio, wherever you get your podcast from. And then uh, around the 412, Steelers, Pirates, Penguins shows once a week. So, and that's separately. So, three different podcasts a week there as well. So, your boy's putting out eight podcasts a week. You're bound to catch me sometime doing yeah. something other than right here on YouTube. <laughs> the podcast God. Yeah. No, Zach's uh, definitely make sure that you guys go subscribe to all his YouTube stuff. Like I said, he puts out great content. Uh, definitely, you know, heavy, heavy ball nowhere, but definitely one of the best, uh, one of the best of the business. So make sure y'all check out his stuff. 
And with that, I will be back for some more videos. Like I said, if y'all do me a favor, if you if you made it this far in the video, please make sure you like, comment, subscribe, turn on notifications, all that good stuff. Your boy is headed to Indy. Uh, by the time this gets released, will be Monday morning, but I'm headed to Indy um, early on Wednesday. So I'll have a bunch of coverage, a bunch of content uh, from the combine. So just make sure you follow along with all that stuff. I will holler at you guys next time. Peace and love.